Only get to use this twice a month, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name's Tyler Duby. I'm your president. Um, we've actually got a quite a bit of announcements and things that we've been up to over like the last month. So um, one of the first things I wanted to highlight was our UT student tailgate partnership with our YMF group. Clint, you were there. Tell us about it. Um, so uh, the Austin YMF, uh, as well as the UT Austin branch of ASE, we had a joint tailgate um, for the Kansas State game. We had around like 60 total students show up uh, throughout the course of the time, just uh, wandering in and out. We had a great sponsor that sponsored all of our food and drinks for the day. Um, I'm a little biased for them. This hat does not work. Um, but um, we love having our sponsors. They got a lot of name recognition, recognition with all our students there. And I think everybody had a great time. We had breakfast tacos and lots of little uh, tailgate games and stuff like that. Good turnout. And thanks to everybody that did come. I think that was awesome. 60 students? Yeah. That's great. Um, so has anybody scanned that QR code on your table? Does anybody know what that thing is? It's the big one. Everybody's got one per table. Um, <clears throat> every year, there's there's always something that comes up that our um, branch likes to donate to. Uh, sometimes it's disaster related. Sometimes it's just for a good cause here in Austin. Uh, we've set up QR codes to... Um, facilitate just collecting funds from, from the branch. Uh, we have about 500 bucks every year that we try to give um, to, to a local charity uh, or to support a disaster. So if you haven't checked that out, uh, scan it with your phone. Um, it has a way to donate um, and, and we appreciate everybody's support in that. A um, <clears throat> Couple of events that we've had this month, there was a Shoal Creek cleanup uh, with our YMF group. Uh, and just this last weekend, we had a mobile loaves and fishes volunteering event. This thing was actually so popular, the volunteers uh, slots filled up so fast. We're going to try to do another one uh, in the spring. So thanks to everybody that attended that, uh, the limited few from our group that could. Um, but one that I, I want to tell everybody about that's coming up uh, next week, you're going to hear from Nick about our Keeling event. We're still short on a few warm bodies to fill out our volunteer roster. Um, and it's a lot of fun. You actually get to go spend your morning with some students at Keeling uh, Middle School for our engineering blitz. Uh, it takes about hour and a half, two hours out of your morning, but you're gonna be glad you did it if you show up. Um, and he's got some really cool swag that uh, he's gonna tell you about. So uh, just wanted to highlight that coming up. Another event that you're going to hear about from Kat is something new. It's a coffee talk. I'm not going to spoil it, but there's coffee involved. <laughs> She's got more details, uh, but uh, that's coming up here in December. So I'm going to turn it over to the rest of our crew to give some announcements of uh, what's coming up in December. And um, just want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. I'm glad you're here. And um, I'll turn it over to you, Kat.
All right. Let's see if we can let this work. Hmm. Okay, well, that works. Okay, now we're in the previous. Got a couple of slides to get through here. Okay, so if we could have Keeling Middle School first. So yeah, like Tyler said, we're, we need like four more people each day, I would say would put us over the, the limit where we don't need to send one person in a classroom by themselves. But it's a, like Tyler said, it's a blast. There will be coffee and some sort of breakfast pastries. You get to give out some very cool ASCE future engineer sunglasses, which are which uh, also um, which are cool. And I don't have the color change pencils that were the real hit last year, but we also have color change pencils which just pass out to the kids. It's real fun. You get to you basically have a competition to build the tallest tower at cups or the largest. Uh, the bridge that holds the most washers. We have done a paper. Uh, it, it goes by super quick and it is super fun. And you get to hang out with uh, some of your professional community in the morning. So sign up, please, or see me if you need help finding the way. Thanks, y'all. All right. Next up, we have YMF. We'll get Clint back up here. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, the class president of YMET this year. Um, we have a couple of upcoming events. We're doing a Coats for Kids with the Junior League of Austin, but we're partnering with the CSEP chapter here in Central Texas. Um, that is on December 4th um, that we're doing. We also have just finalized our date for the uh, annual joint networking happy hour that we do with everybody um, that's in the Central Texas area from AWWA. Engineers Without Borders, the support from Main Brand, EWRI, and that'll be February 19th. And we're doing a change of location this year. Usually it's uh, last year it was at Hula Hut because um, Ables on the Lake was getting re uh, remodeled, but we're not back over there because they're still in transition of management. So we are moving to the east side of town. We are going to be at Lazarus on East 6th Street. Um, and so we'll have a large happy hour on the Monday of evening on February 19th. Um, we had a great turnout at our tailgate, um, as we talked about earlier, and we collected 11 bags of trash in an e-scooter, as well as a one wood out of Shoal Creek um, this, uh, two Saturdays ago. And we also have an upcoming holiday social that will be at Mozart Poppy Roasters on uh, over towards April from Lake and Hula Hut again, um, where we're going to watch the live show together as YMF, well, and so we're going to open up tickets for that pretty soon. Yeah. Right. Um, next up, we have the Garibald Hartunian Award and um, Civil Engineer of the Award. Uh, this is a, a new award that we've put into place, um, and we are taking nominations due on January 8th. We'd really like to get those in in December if possible. And then the winner of this award will be presented at the 2024 TSB Engineers Banquet in February. And uh, you can find the nomination form on our Austin Branch website. And you can also contact Glenn Goldstein, one of our past presidents, with any questions. If you turn over the handout everyone has on the back, there is a QR code. And if you scan that, we have a link tree to a lot of these events that we're listing here today, including our calendar. So if anything here sounds interesting, feel free to click on that. Um, and you can sign up and look at the web events we have coming up. All right, speaking of events, next up we have our ASC Continuing Education Conference. We have a save the date for this, Friday, April 12th, 2024 at the JJ Pickle Research Campus. Ooh, and I'll let Steve. Oh boy. <laughs> so we are looking for volunteers for this event. We're going to need someone for registration, someone to handle IT issues that may come up. We want specifically two people to lead the tours that have become popular. Uh, from the past couple of years that we've done this. And again, it's going to be April the 12th, JJ Pickle Center, 
And it's a great way to get your PDOs knocked out ahead of time. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. All right, last up, Tyler brought this up, but we are starting our inaugural ASU coffee chats. So drop off the kids, come socialize out with us at EV Tiger in the Lake. This will be on December 12th. So we're kind of getting it in between the holidays um, from seven to 9 a.m. Um, and you can scan the QR code here on the screen, or if you go to that link tree on the back of the handout, there's also a sign up, just so we can get a head count and kind of figure out how much coffee to get for everyone. All right, and lastly, follow us on social media. Um, you can get to these on the link tree, but uh, we're all over the place. So you can kind of figure out what we're up to on social media. All right, next up, I'd like to invite up Ron. Our sponsor today is Ameritex, and so he'll tell us a little bit about that. Right. I got this fancy gold name pack. <laughs> <laughs> really feels special. Thank you. There you go. I don't need them. Ah, uh, there you go. Oh, got you a clicker. Don't okay, do I have to stay in front of this or can I wander around? Well, I hide, hide to those online there. Thing. Okay. Wait, all right, tell me which way goes up and down. This is different to me. Uh, I can't see anything. Okay. All right. That's forward and back. I believe so. All right, we'll find out. Okay, well, thank you. It's good to be here again. Uh, Austin is a place I've attended meetings for years. And I know a lot of folks. Meetings keep moving around. We're always somewhere different, and this is a good place. Uh, we we ended up actually sponsoring the same meeting last year, so I something felt very familiar when I walked in and saw the PELS speaker. I was like, "Hey, flashback here, time warp." But anyway, yes. So Ameritex Pipe, we are a yeah. I went the wrong way, Cat. There we go. Um, who we are? We we manufacture reinforced concrete pipe box culvert for storm drain. So we're based in Seguin. We have plants in Conroe and up in Gunner, and that's all good, well and good. Uh, what I want to recognize, though, and take my minute here is uh, we can't do anything we do. We can't go places freely and safely if it wasn't for the sacrifices made by our military. Uh, we have veterans in the room. I know anybody that's a military veteran, raise their hand, please. Uh, you want to tell us what branches? Army. 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 There we go. Army. <clears throat> Everything we do in, in the United States of America, where we don't have missiles slamming into buildings overnight or uh, occupying armies in our streets, is because of our military veterans. Millions of Americans have made that sacrifice of their time, and hundreds of thousands of Americans have paid the ultimate sacrifice. We just had Veterans Day a couple weeks ago, but every day should be Veterans Day because there's people from way back to where they didn't even have photographs, uh, you know, revolutionary war time up until today, young men and women have left home and gone to serve and to protect us, to keep us free. And I think they're deserving of our thanks. So how about a round of applause for our veterans? And as I said, every day should also be Memorial Day. Uh, it, it, we look at how we're in the anniversary couple of weeks of some uh, horrific battles throughout our history. The Battle of Tarawa in World War II, Hill 873 in Vietnam, Doc To, 65, 67, just a uh, to tremendous loss of life uh, to, to keep us free. Whatever your politics are, whether you believe in the wars or not, celebrate and, and honor the those that fought because they aren't there for political reasons. They're there to defend our country. Um, I... I I have three young men uh, shown up here that were in my nephew's platoon uh, company in Afghanistan. And I look at the ages, 19, 21, and 23, and I think back to what I was doing at that age, and it wasn't anything close to this. And in fact, I'm glad there weren't cell phones everywhere and cameras when I was that age, because I probably wouldn't want a lot of it seen in public. But one thing I do want to point out, this young man in the center, Sergeant Juan Navarro, anybody go to, I think it was Lanier High School here in Austin? This was renamed in his honor. I actually went by there this morning on my way here to see it. It's now Juan Navarro Early College High School or something like that, which I think is a tremendous honor for someone who gave his life for our freedom. So, uh, again, remember those that sacrificed for us. And um, also remember 22 veterans a day take their lives. That should be a number we should not accept. Of my nephew's platoon of 20 young men, there are only 11 still alive. Three were lost in combat, five have taken their own lives. 
they're still suffering casualties, even though they've been home for 11 years. So if you know a veteran, especially someone, a combat veteran around Memorial Day, Veterans Day, anytime, just a text message, a phone call, an email, make sure they're okay. Make sure uh, my nephew tells me every year it's you and Aunt Pam and, and everybody's texts and calls that keep me positive and keep me vertical for another year. So it does make a difference. So reach out, help those folks and do the best we can. Also want to say our first responders play a big role. I know it's easy to think all they do is write speeding tickets. Uh, sometimes they're in some very bad situations that um, require a lot of sacrifice. So again, there's a lot of people out there sacrificing for our safety, for us to be able to go perform our duties as civil engineers or manufacturers and come gather like this to uh, network and advance our, our profession. There's people behind the scenes making sure we're able to do that. Here's some charities if you're interested that support veterans and uh, first responders. I The branch will have this if anybody needs it or you can reach out to me, I'd be happy to give that to you. And with that having been said, that's my time. Pat, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, next up, I'd like to invite up Michael Sims, uh, Director of Compliance and Enforcement for the Texas Board of Professional Engineers. Today, he'll be talking to us about professional practice updates and ethics uh, for the board. What do you think, Mike or no, Mike? Uh, can y'all hear me or do I need the mic? Perfect. Cool. There we go. Cool. All right, good afternoon, I guess we are now, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, again, Michael Sims, I'm Director of Compliance and Enforcement with the Board of Engineers and Land Surveyors, here to talk a little bit about what we got going on at the board, uh, just a couple things to highlight, uh, main things I had to talk about, a little bit about the board itself. Go through our core functions, a little bit of statistics and demographics, what we're seeing trends as far as professional engineering in the state. Uh, go through a couple of scenarios, just get you thinking about how active board roles might apply to things you encounter in your day-to-day -day activities and then recent activities we've undertaken at the board. If you need to connect with us at any point, our website's probably the good first place to start, pels.texas.gov. Has all the information for getting licensed, renewing your license, filing a complaint, the act and rules, all of that is on our website. Also, uh, we have presence on most of the major professional and social networking, if that's something you're interested in. Um, share updates through those also. Talk a little bit about regulation of surveying and engineering in the state of Texas. Uh, clearly, they've been around before they were ever officially regulated, but the first official government regulation of either of those professions occurred a little over 100 years ago. In 1919, when an initial land surveying board was established for surveying publicly held land or governmentally owned, government owned land. And then uh, the first engineering board came into be in Texas in 1937. Uh, Wyoming was the first state that regulated engineering, but uh, it's been regulated in Texas a little over 85 years at this point uh, in response to the New London school explosion. Uh, school in East Texas in the 1930s uh, built a new school for the uh, growing population. It was very close to the East Texas oil field, so a lot of economic prosperity in the area. Part of that uh, New school, they were pulling natural gas from the nearby oil field to heat the school. That system had some design flaws that allowed natural gas to collect in the basement of the school. It was prior to gas being odorized, uh, went undetected, uh, spark from a shop teacher ignited that natural gas, resulted in an explosion that killed 300 teachers and students. So obviously a tragic event then would be a tragic event now. That's what prompted the legislature in the state to decide that the engineering profession needed to be regulated to ensure that the health, safety, and welfare of the people of Texas was protected. Uh, 1955, a second surveying board was established. Uh, that was for surveying privately owned land. So your residential surveys, ranches, things like that would have fallen under that board. 
1979, those two surveying boards combined uh, to form what was the Board of Professional Land Surveying. And then in 2019, uh, a little over four years ago now at this point, the surveying and engineering boards merged. That was a legislative decision to form the Board of Professional Engineers and Land Surveyors. Uh, a lot of that merger was just due to improved efficiency of operations. Uh, the previous engineering board, we had about 30 employees. So still a fairly small agency. Uh, the surveying board had four employees. So you can imagine trying to run a governmental agency with four people is a bit of a challenge. So that was the main motivation between combining the two boards, just to have a little bit of scale of operations and uh, efficiency of operations. So if you're not familiar with us, uh, the board is a state agency. We're in charge of regulating the engineering and land surveying professions in the state of Texas. So similar to the state bar for attorneys, the medical bar board for doctors, we're the agency uh, in charge of regulating the engineering and surveying professions in Texas. Uh, our operations are overseen by a part-time uh, board. Their governor appointed members that provide oversight and direction to uh, the board staff who carry out all of our day-to-day -day operations. So our mission statement at the board hopefully also tracks kind of your mission statement as a licensee, but we're here to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the people of Texas. Uh, we do that through three main ways, uh, licensing qualified individuals as engineers or land surveyors, also ensuring compliance with applicable laws and rules, make sure that our licensees are doing things properly and that non-licensees aren't offering services that could endanger the public. And then providing education about engineering and surveying to our licensees, to other governmental entities, the public, students, anybody who has any interest in the engineering and land surveying professions, we'll just try to be a resource to them and provide information to them about the professions. So again, our board itself is uh, made up of government appointed people. It's a nine member board. Uh, they all are not with us full time. They have their own practices. Um, it's a part time position to provide oversight to the agency. But the current breakdown of our board, it's five engineers, one surveyor. So both in both uh, professions that we regulate is represented. And then also three public members, again, just to, uh, Going back to that we're here to protect the public, we want to make sure that an engineer is not just looking out for the interests of the profession, we're truly here to look out for the public. Uh, so those nine voting members are again governor appointed, they serve six year terms, uh, typically staggered where uh, every two years we have three members terms uh, expire. So every couple of years we see a slight change in the composition of the board, just a new, new ideas coming in to provide that direction to uh, the board's staff. We also have a 10th non-voting member who represents the general land office. The GLO is in charge of a lot of the surveying of state-owned land, so he's just there to provide insight uh, for any surveying discussions with state-owned land uh, that comes into play. So this is our current board. Um, you can see good geographic diversity. Uh, we have most areas of the state are represented. Through our PE members, we also have a good diversity of uh, their specialties. We have a couple of civil engineers, a structural, a software, and a petroleum engineer. So good diversity as far as their area of expertise also, or their area of practice. Um, so they're full, very engaged group, uh, provide direction to us, assistance, oversight, guidance to the board staff. Um, and again, just all of them are shown there if you, uh, need to get in touch with any of them, we can help coordinate that uh, through our office. As far as the staff members, uh, we just have the one office here in Austin. Again, fairly small agency. We don't have any district or regional offices, just uh, one office here in Austin. Uh, this is our executive management. Lance Kinney is our executive director, has been in that role probably 15 to 20 years at this point. I'm over the compliance and enforcement group. Rick Strong is over our licensing and registration group. And then Mason Schofield is over our operations group. And then it's the other 30 or so members that are who you probably talk to on the day-to-day -day basis if you call in a highly dedicated group to help process complaints, process registrations, renewals, everything, just a resource to our licensees and the public. So again, we're a governmental agency, so we are tasked with uh, overseeing and enforcing different uh, provisions of the laws of the state of Texas. 
the Engineering Practice Act being one of those. Um, it's chapter 1001 of the Occupations Code. So uh, the Engineering Practice Act itself is adopted by the legislature. Any changes to the act also have to go through the legislature. So at the board level, we can't make changes to the act itself. We are charged with enforcing the act, but we don't draft the act or amend the act. Uh, what the act does, it defines what the practice of engineering is, generally speaking, to offer services to the public or a third party. You have to be licensed. There are some exemptions from licensure that's detailed in the act. Uh, the powers of the board, our enforcement process, our licensing process, process all of that's laid out in the Engineering Practice Act. With the merger, we are also tasked with overseeing the Professional Land Surveying Practices Act, similar to the Engineering Act, just a different chapter uh, having to deal with land surveying. Again, defines what surveying is, the registration process, and uh, what the practice of land surveying and expectations are of land surveyors. In addition to the acts, we also are tasked with overseeing our board rules. So unlike the acts, which are adopted by the legislature, our board rules are adopted by the board itself. So the board adopts the board rules and they also can make changes to our board rules. So our board rules kind of expand upon the acts. If you think of the acts are kind of the overall guidance and then the details get into our board rules. Uh, they're found in the administrative code, specifically chapters 131 through 140. Are where our board rules are and uh again these are adopted by the board itself uh public input on any of the board rules um, but they do have to have a basis in the act if we don't have some sort of general authority given to us by the legislature we can't take that authority uh and or adopt rules to regulate certain things that are not uh foundationally supported by the powers given to the board in the acts themselves so here's the uh, layout of our board rules, kind of how they're generally laid out. The early or the first chapters and the last chapters kind of mirror, uh, or excuse me, they don't mirror, they apply to both professions. Uh, chapter 131 is just about the board itself, how we operate administration, our powers. And then cha the end chapters, chapter 139 and 140 are both also both common to both professions. 139 details our enforcement process. The process doesn't really change much depending on whether you're an engineer or surveyor, how we conduct investigations. So that's a combined chapter. And then chapter 140 is a new chapter uh, that was adopted earlier this year. Um, not a lot of new content, if you will, just moved, but it deals with how we consider criminal convictions uh, for our licensees and our applicants and just lays out all that process. And then the middle rules, kind of generally speaking, the odd number rules have to do with engineering, the even number rules have to do with surveying, but they deal with how you get licensed, how you register a firm. And then uh, chapter 137 for our active engineering licensees is where the meat of the rules on is kind of expecting how you're expected to practice general is all laid out in our compliance and professionalism rule. So that's the main rule you uh, probably would need to refer to if you are an active licensee and just interested in what is expected of you as a licensee when you interact with the public or clients, things like that. <clears throat> the board rules kind of, you can break them down into three main categories. Uh, the first has to do with eth ethical expectations. Uh, examples of those are that our licensees are expected to avoid a conflict of interest, that they're a faithful agent to their client. If you have a dissenting opinion that you are prepared to share that if you see a project going down a route that could endanger the public. It's expected that you'll speak up and share those concerns rather than just sit silently and let the project continue down a route that could endanger health, safety, and welfare of the public. Kind of the second umbrella has to do with uh, professionalism. Examples of that is how you communicate with people. There's an expectation that you're honest, that you're clear, that you show respect to all involved parties, uh, that you help maintain the public trust and you timely communicate with the board if we need to get in touch with you or need your assistance with something. There's an expectation that you'll get back to us in a timely manner to us, assist us with those issues. And again, kind of the third branch has to do with your competence, uh, the third grouping, if you will, of the rules. So our competence, uh, is measured up front when you apply to be licensed, you have to have a certain education and experience, depending on what your educational background is, you have to have a corresponding number of years of experience in order to be eligible to become licensed. 
Then you also demonstrate that competence through examinations. Uh, we use standard national exams to uh, measure those, the FE and the PE exam. Um, so all of that is how we look at your competence up front. A lot of our rules are similar to other states. Um, if you're licensed in another state, most likely you would be eligible to also be licensed here. But we do spend time with each application just because you're licensed, say, in Louisiana doesn't mean you would automatically be licensed in Texas. You still have to apply here. And our licensing group does spend time reviewing that application to uh, make sure that you are eligible to competently offer services to the people of Texas. Um, it's kind of an overall effort to make those requirements uh, not efficient, uh, equivalent between, excuse me, different states to make sure that people can move between states, but it is a separate licensing process. It's not a national license. It is still a state license. Keep in mind that we don't discipline or that we don't license by discipline. All engineers in the state get the same license. So whether you're a civil engineer, or mechanical engineer, you all get the same PE license, but there is an expectation that you only practice in your area of competence. Uh, practice outside your area of competence is a violation of board rules. And then more importantly, it does endanger the public if you're offering services that you don't have the competence to offer those services or take on that project. Talk a little bit about the numbers and kind of what we're seeing uh, on the engineering side. Uh, this is a little out of date. I need to update the slide, but we just issued recently our 150,000 PE license in the state. So about 150,000 people have been licensed in the state in the 85 years or so that license has been around. And then we're at about 73,000 active licensees. So about half the total people that have ever been licensed still currently hold their license. Um, and then we have about 11,400 engineering firms. On the surveying side, we have about 6,800 surveying licenses have ever been issued and we're at about 2,700 um, active surveyors. That number stays pretty constant. Each year we license about 100 new surveyors. We lose about 100. So not a lot of growth on the surveying side. Um, it's an issue that some of the next couple of slides will illustrate we're aware of trying to make sure that we're not putting unnecessary hurdles to make sure that there are enough surveyors to provide services to the state, but uh, not a lot of growth on the surveying side. And then about 1,300 surveying firms. As far as the growth of the licensure, that's really dark, so you probably can't read it very well. But um, trend over the last 10 years, we were at about 10 years ago, we were at about 3,000 licensees, new licenses being issued per year on the engineering side. So that would represent new people to both new people to the profession and also if somebody's moved to Texas, working on a project in Texas and needed to get licensed here. So it's not necessarily just new engineers. It could be very experienced engineers just getting newly licensed. But we were at about 3,000. It had peaked up to about 4,000 pre uh, right before COVID. Uh, pretty big drop. That's the dip you can see uh, about 2020. Uh, I don't know if you can really see the numbers, but we dropped back down to 3,200 and then the numbers have restabilized. We're at about 3,800 new licenses uh, in the past couple of years. Again, that overall number represents about a growth of a thousand, uh, a net of about a thousand per year. Uh, so about 3,800 licenses, we lose about 2,000 of those. Either people die, retire, or move out of state. But a net gain of about 1,000 active licensees in the state per year is what we're seeing on the engineering side. And again, on the surveying side, about 2,700, and that number stayed pretty constant in the past several years. As far as the breakdown of different branches, um, say somewhat misconception that people think the vast majority of the licensees are civil. It is our biggest discipline by far. Uh, about 44% of our active licensees are civil engineers. And then the breakdown is you can see all the different professions people are licensed in. Civil, mechanical, electrical, structural, chemical are kind of the biggest professions all the way down to one ceramic engineer in the state who actually lives in Florida. So I don't know how much ceramic engineering is actually going on in Texas, but we do have that one ceramic engineer licensed here. To be honest, I don't really even know what a ceramic engineer would do, but we have one. Yeah. Uh, then as far as the breakdown of our age of our PE licensees, 
Um, starting at about 12 o'clock, we have about 3,200 licensees that are in their 20s. And then fairly even numbers, 13 to 14, 15,000. The orange is people in their 30s. The gray is people in their 40s. The kind of gold is people in their 50s. So about a quarter each or 20% each in those ranges. And then we have about 12,000 individuals in their 60s that are still actively licensed, 4,200 people in their 70s, and then 750 people over 80 that are still actively licensed in the state. Kind of comparison between the two professions, uh, surveyors are in blue, engineers are in orange. As far as age of our licensees, you can see that as I talked about a little bit earlier, surveying is definitely an older profession. It uh, skews older. You can see uh, the biggest portion of our licensed surveyors, about 30% are in their 60s and about half the total surveyors in the state are over 60. So you can see that is an issue that's kind of looming out there to make sure that we are getting enough surveyors in the pipeline to ensure that there are enough surveyors to provide services to the state. And then engineers, it's a little more evenly distributed about a quarter each in their 30s, 40s, and fairly good distribution on the engineering side. <coughs> as far as years licensed, uh, this one kind of surprised me when I pulled it. Uh, our biggest percentage of active licensees, uh, kind of the 12 to about four o'clock is people licensed less than five years. So about 30% of our Engineering licensees have been licensed for less than five years. The orange is people six to 10 years. The gray, about a quarter have been licensed 11 to 20 years. Uh, the gold, about 78,000 people have been licensed 20 to 30 years. About 6,000 have been actively licensed for 30 to 40 years. About 2,000 from 40 to 50. And then we have 400 individuals that have been actively licensed for over 50 years. Then again, just break down, comparing the two professions, surveyors in blue, engineers in orange, um, you can see engineers do trend overall towards uh, less years license, which again is attributable to the growth of, of the profession. We're seeing more people get licensed each year. So that does somewhat track why it does, would trend to a fewer years license on the engineering side. Move to a scenario now, just, uh, get you thinking about how things may apply to you, uh, just a reminder. But uh, in this one, which of the following items are you timely required to report to the board if you are licensed with us? A, a change in email address or home phone number, B, any change of employer, C, any disciplinary actions, D, any lawsuits brought against you, or E, none of the above. Anyone? Uh, hearing a lot of mixed bag on this one. Uh, best answer on this one is B and C, uh, change for employer and disciplinary actions. So uh, just a reminder things, if you are licensed, that you do need to make sure that you let us know about within 30 days of any change. Uh, a name change, mailing address, um, that's unfortunately just somewhat of an older thing. Um, we're still required to do all of our official notification through mail. So that's why mailing address has to be updated. We request and ask that you keep your phone number and email address updated with us also, but it's just the act hasn't been updated to really incorporate the change in technology. It's still mailing addresses. All of our official correspondence has to be sent through the mail. Um, any change of employer information that applies both to you and your employer. If you work for a registered firm, just make sure you update if you change jobs, who you work for, and then also make sure your new employer updates to claim you uh, with our records. It does help more so with smaller firms where we get into issues where they may not have an active licensee anymore, where somebody leaves and then they don't have a licensee or things like that. But it is a requirement overall to update your uh, employment status within 30 days. Any disciplinary actions taken in another state. So if you're licensed in multiple states and got in trouble in a different state, you have to let us know about that. Uh, we do have the ability to take reciprocal action on those items. So we review those. And then also criminal convictions, except for traffic tickets, you have to let us know about uh, the, that new chapter 140 I talked about kind of references the things we care about. Usually it's more if it directly impacts your ability to offer services. 
So just because you say you get one DWI, you have to let us know about it, but most likely if it's your first one or as an active licensee, we're not gonna do anything, but there still is a requirement to notify us of those actions within 30 days. And again, that's just for convictions. You don't have to let us know about getting arrested. Uh, just if you actually get convicted is where that kicks in. So as a licensee, you do have a wide range of actions and options you can take. You have legal obligations, ethical obligations, obligations to your client, obligations to your employer, obligations to the public. Uh, kind of how you weigh all of those and make your decisions and your designs as you asserting your professional responsibility over your work. Uh, Subchapter C of Chapter 137 goes into or where most of the rules dealing with your responsibility as a licensee are found has to do with signing and sealing your work, making sure you supervise work, that you're objective and truthful, that you exhibit care and diligence in your work, that you're aware of actions of others, that you don't aid and abet anybody in unlicensed practice, that you're aware of or comply with local, state, federal codes and ordinances, uh, making sure you complete your continuing education as part of your professional responsibility, and complying with the Professional Services Procurement Act if you do any sort of public sector work. Signing and sealing probably becomes second nature to you if you do it enough, but there is a lot that is indicated through your seal and signature on your work product. Uh, your seal and signature indicates that work was done by you or under your direct supervision, that it's complete and accurate if it's, uh, it should only be signed and sealed if it's a final work product. If it is preliminary work, it should be properly notated. Uh, if you're issuing something for a limited scope, for example, permitting review, that should be clearly communicated that it, what the scope it's being issued for. And if it's not intended, say, for construction, that that's clearly communicated on the set of plans. If more than one licensee worked on it, the responsible party should both sign and seal it and make clear who did what. So if anybody has questions on a specific aspect of the design, they can know who to reach out to. And then issue date and revision should also be clearly communicated. Move to a scenario now about uh, performing your engineering work. And this one, uh, it's simplified, but a uh, homeowner needs a signed and sealed floodplain certification to close on the sale of her home. She does the research online to fill out the floodplain form, but then realizes it needs to be signed and sealed by an engineer. So she asks her neighbor who's a PE if he can sign and seal it for her. So the closing of her home does not get delayed. In order to help his neighbor, the PE decides to sign and seal the form, thinking the overall risk associated with this project is minimal. In this situation, uh, which board rules were violated, A, the rule that says license holders shall only seal work done by them or performed under their direct supervision. B, the rule that says the issuance of oral or written assertions in the practice of engineering should not be misleading. C, the rule that says engineers shall engage in professional and business activities in an honest and ethical manner, or D, all of the above. Here in D's, which is the best answer, again, it's not enough just to do some, give something a quick review and sign and seal it. You can only sign and seal work that was done by you or performed under your direct supervision. Signing and sealing work that's not your own does give a misleading impression to the public. When somebody sees your seal on it, they rightfully assume you directly were involved in its preparation. And then uh, passing off someone else's work as your own also gets into honesty and ethical issues. Uh, it's a simplified version of plain stamping. It's a pretty serious violation that we pursue pretty aggressively. Can be difficult to prove, but uh, just overall, just don't kind of engage in this sort of practice. It puts the public at risk and just not a good practice to seal work that you weren't directly involved in. Move to a situation now having to deal with uh, direct supervision. You're a licensed engineer, you supervise others who perform engineering work on your projects under your direct supervision. After you signed, sealed, dated, and issued engineering plans, for the design of a hotel, it was found that the design of one of the support columns holding up an awning over the hotel entryway was inadequate. And if that design flaw wasn't corrected, it could result in a collapse of the awning. During the project, one of your engineers in training performed the column analysis, which you used to complete the overall design. If a complaint were to be filed against you with the board, what level of responsibility would you bear and what level would the EIT bear for the inadequate design of the columns? A, you'd be 100% responsible. B, it would be split between you and the EIT 50. C, uh, nobody's responsible, the issue is not corrected. Uh, so no harm, no foul. Or D, the EIT is responsible.
Yeah, Lance Rod Rules A, you're responsible. You're the licensee, you're the one that signed and sealed it. Mm -hmm. When you uh, sign and seal the work, you're taking the responsible responsibility for anything issued under your seal and signature. One, I think this is the last scenario, uh, has to do with honesty and objectiveness. Uh, you've been engaged to perform a engineering inspection by his business owner whose building was damaged by a recent hailstorm. He lets you know that his insurance claim was denied and he's wanting to hire you to help him refute that claim denial. Business owner informs you that a PE working on behalf of the insurance company has already been out, looked at the building and described some of the damage as being caused by the recent hailstorm, but most of it was older damage that could not be attributed to the recent storm event. Again, he's hoping to hire you and hoping your report can be used to prove to the insurance company that it should pay for a complete roof replacement. You conduct your inspection and uh, basically agree with the engineer that's already been out. Some of the damage was caused by the storm, but most of it is not due to the recent storm. What should you do? A, provide weather data and photographs of the damage. Write a report indicating that all the damage was related to the storm event in order to support your client. B, provide weather data and photographs. Write a report with your conclusion. Some of the damage was caused by the storm. Some of it predated the storm with detailed information that supports how you reached that conclusion. C, decline the engagement because you don't believe the client was interested in an objective finding. Or D, decline the engagement because you do not believe there's ever a winner in insurance-related claims. So uh, on this one, there's several acceptable answers, I guess, if you will. Uh, C and D are both acceptable. You can, it's up to you to decide what uh, jobs you want to take on if you're not getting good, got good vibes from a client or can't provide the services they're looking for, you can decline the job. If you also want to take the position, I'm not doing anything with insurance, not worth my time. That's also acceptable. Uh, but what we're, for what we're trying to illustrate with this example, B is the best answer. Uh, provide the weather data, uh, provide weather data photographs, write your report and support how you reach your conclusion. Uh, what we're trying to illustrate with this example is just part of your responsibility is to be honest, objective, and truthful, regardless of your client. The conditions don't really change. So whether you're working for the insurance company or the building owner, your report should be fairly similar because the conditions are what they are. Be sure, be sure to support your conclusions with data and facts and don't exhibit any sort of bias or preferential treatment based on your client. Talk a little bit about continuing education. Uh, just a reminder, uh, when you renew your license each year, you self-certify that you've met the continuing education requirements for that preceding renewal cycle. Uh, what those requirements are, are 15 hours per year with at least one hour of ethics. Just a reminder, it is based on your renewal cycle, not necessarily the calendar year. So if you're, uh, say, a September renewal, your continuing education cycle will be October 1 to September 30th. The only people who actually have uh, their cycle line up exactly with the calendar year or December renewals. So just keep that in mind so you don't run into a situation where you get your hours uh, thinking it's calendar year, but it may not fall into your actual renewal cycle. Probably the most common way people get hours uh, going to a conference, a presentation where there's a set topic, set at a set time, you get some sort of documentation, keep that for your records. That's probably the most common way to get hours. There are a lot of other hours out there, options to get hours. Uh, Self-study is probably the most common alternate means. Um, so rather than a set topic, it's doing things on your own, reading the act and board rules on your own could count as self-study. Uh, reading a journal with updates or research topics could also count as self-study. Just write down the date, time, what you did. You can claim those hours of self-study. That is capped at five hours per year. And then there's a lot of other hour options out there. Um, some of the things y'all have talked about, like the junior high event, you could count that as self as continuing at hours. Um, K through 12 outreach or college outreach, you can get hours for that, giving presentation, helping judge a science fair, things like that can count, serving in a uh, leadership role of a technical society, uh, giving a presentation, publishing a paper. It's all laid, laid out in the rules. There's probably about 15 to 20 different things you can get hours for. Uh, the details are there, uh, and if there's a cap for that activity per year, that's also found in the board rules. Um, main objective, again, is that you stay current with developments in your field and kind of how the rules laid out. If it has technical, managerial, or ethical content that would benefit your individual practice, then you can count that activity as self-study. We don't really 
or we don't, we don't, not that we don't really, we don't pre-approve events. We don't make that call for you. It's up to you to kind of know what benefits your individual practice and for you to make that call. Um, if an activity does have educational managerial or ethical content that would benefit your individual practice. You are allowed to roll forward hours. So if you get excess hours this year, you can roll forward hours to next year. I, so if you got 40 hours this year, you would meet the 15 for this year. And then you could roll 14 of those forward to next year. Uh, you do have to actively get, actively get your one hour of ethics during each renewal cycle. So you can bank excess ethics hours if you just got a lot this year towards your 14 hours, but you then would also have to actively get an hour of ethics uh, during each renewal cycle. We do audit continuing education. Um, after each renewal cycle, we select a random population, ask them for their records. Typically everything looks good. Um, we usually only look at one year of records, but uh, if your records are a little off, we do have the ability to ask back to three years. So just make sure you do keep your continuing ed records on a rolling three-year basis. Talk a little bit about compliance and enforcement. Um, majority of our cases on the are in the enforcement side result from us receiving a complaint either from the public or another licensee that is aware of a situation. Uh, breakdown of cases, we get about, excuse me, 650 to 700 per year um, is how many cases we're handling. About 600 on the engineering side, about 50 on the surveying side. Kind of how the process works. Uh, we receive a complaint, we review it, make sure that there's something we have jurisdiction over and that there's enough information to support that a violation may have actually occurred. Gets assigned to an investigator. They talk to all the involved parties just to get an understanding of the situation. And then they write up a memo summarizing what's going on and if they feel there is sufficient evidence to support that a violation has occurred. And then that document gets reviewed by our executive management to decide how we are going to uh, resolve the complaint. About 60% of the cases get resolved through voluntary compliance. So a minor violation, there was no active threat to health, safety, and welfare. We may close it out through voluntary compliance. About 30% receive uh, some sort of formal written guidance or an actual formal sanction. And then about 10% get dismissed. Again, the enforcement process does start through filing, through filing a complaint. If you're aware of a situation, you want to just talk to us to kind of get a feeling on whether we feel that may be a uh, violation of the rules. You can reach out to us through any means to kind of have that initial conversation. But if you do decide to move forward with filing a formal complaint, we do have to receive that in writing either through the mail or email. We have a complaint form on our website that kind of helps you. We found helps people kind of organize their thoughts. We recommend you use that form. We're in the process of updating it. Um, but you can use that form or just provide a letter or email so letting us know what's going on. Uh, if you're aware of a situation or a violation, you want to file a formal complaint with us. If you do decide to file a complaint, make sure that you provide instances of the violation and any evidence you have to back up that an actual violation has occurred. We do need some sort of physical evidence to open an investigation. We can't just move forward with Joe's a terrible engineer. You should take his license away. We need something more concrete than that. Um, sadly, we get those sometimes and then people get mad when we can't do much with that. But uh, just make sure that you do give us information to let us know what's going on and back up the situation so we can fully understand the situation. So again, the most serious actions resulting out of our enforcement process are uh, sanctions from the board. There's a wide range of actions the board can take. Uh, the least serious of those would be a reprimand. We can do suspensions or probations, difference there. You can practice if you're on probation, uh, as long as you don't have any additional violations during your probationary period. If you're actively suspended, you cannot practice while you're suspended. We can revoke licenses. We can issue cease and desist orders. That's typically for people engaged in unlicensed practice. That gets it kind of formally on the record that they're engaged in unlicensed practice. And then if they continue to do it, then we can refer it to the attorney general's office to pursue criminal actions if they continue to engage in unlicensed practice. And then uh, we can also pursue emergency suspensions and 
specific cases where we feel somebody is an active real-time threat to health, safety, or welfare, we can suspend their license while we conduct the investigation, but it's very specific conditions have to be met for us to pursue that route. We do have other options we can do in tandem with the reprimand or a probation. If it seems it's a ethical transgression, we may require people to take an ethics course. Uh, we use courses through the Murdo Center for Engineering Professionalism, which is part of Texas Tech University. So these are 30, 60, or 90 hour courses on professional practice um, correspondence courses. We can also require technical courses and may do that in tandem with practice limitations if it seems you're kind of lost your confidence in a specific area or it may prevent you from practicing in that area until you complete a technical course. Usually we have people audit our college courses to kind of reestablish our confidence in that specific area. We can also do administrative penalties. Uh, it's capped at $5,000 per violation per day. That's essentially a fine that goes to the state of Texas, not to the board itself. And then we can do restitution also. With all of our enforcement actions, everything except informal reprimands does have to be published. We do that through three ways. After each board meeting, we put all the enforcement actions on our website. We also add them to a national exchange that all the states have access to. And then we also publish them in our newsletter that typically goes out quarterly. There are some limitations to our enforcement program. Uh, again, we can only do things that we have the authority to do from the legislature. Things we don't have the authority to uh, do through our enforcement program is assess monetary damages or settle disputed property boundaries. Both of those would have to be handled through the civil court system. The board itself can't make somebody pay for damages based on a, if a bad design caused damages to a building. We don't have the ability to um, assess those damages. It would have to be pursued through the court system. We also don't insert ourselves into engineering or serving decisions made by other governmental agencies or local entities, City of Houston, City of Austin. Uh, we can take action against an engineer working for a city that if they did something wrong, but we can't go in and overrule the Austin City Council if they just because it involves engineering doesn't give the board the right to go in and tell them they can't do something. They have their own jurisdiction over their own issues. We also um, don't get into billing and uh, project timing issues for firms. Uh, the, pretty much the extent of our jurisdiction over firms is, the, is that they are registered with us prior to the offering services. Just general recommendations to prevent enforcement, uh, your potential exposure to enforcement action and complaints. Just have clear communication, a clear contract. A lot of the complaints are due to misunderstandings. So clear communication, clear contract, uh, have things in writing. Make sure your calculations and designs are clear and that they're consistent with generally accepted engineering concepts. And if you follow all those, your potential exposure to enforcement should be fairly reduced. And then also have documentation. And then know what the expectations are of you as a licensee and you have a question on what a rule means or how you should handle a situation, feel free to reach out to us and I get that clarification rather than uh, making a bad interpretation and then running into issues down the road. As far as recent activities, we've had a couple of rule packages this year. Um, we updated criminal history, which I talked about earlier, and addressed how surveyors get licensed. Uh, legislative session, the regular session, wrapped up earlier this year. Um, from that, not a whole lot to report, nothing that really affected board operations. Um, there are some stuff that may affect ind individual licensees having to deal with uh, liability and things like that, but nothing that affects the board directly. Um, we'll see. We're, we're currently in a special session also. So uh, if anything comes out that we need to let our licensees know about, don't really anticipate engineering or surveying being a high priority for special sessions. But if there's anything that comes out of those, we'll be sure to let people know uh, to communicate that if there's anything that you need to be aware of. We did update the surveying exam, uh, just a quick recap of that. Um, previously, to get licensed as a surveyor in Texas, we are the only state that didn't use the national PS exam. Uh, we used an eight hour exam that the board developed that uh, covered both general surveying and Texas specific surveying topics. Uh, the last version of that was offered this spring and we shifted now to using the PS exam 
and then a four hour exam on specific surveying topics specific to Texas. There are still specific knowledge that surveyors need to know to competently practice in Texas, make sure that they're aware of those Texas specific uh, requirements, a lot of it having to do with just our history, kind of different land rule, land rules here, uh, being under different nations previously to being a state. So there is specific knowledge that they do need to make sure that people are aware of. But we've shifted to a four hour exam on that that will be offered three times a year. And then they have to take the national PS exam to uh, cover general surveying topics. First version of that was offered this uh, fall and overall pretty good feedback on that new setup that we have in place now for licensing surveyors in the state. We also try to engage, uh, again, education and engagement is kind of the third prong of our mission statement. Do that through uh, webinars. Uh, we offer updates at least once a month that anybody can sign up for. Um, similar to this presentation, but rather than a specific group, just open sign up. We're looking to shift, hopefully in the next couple of months, rather than giving our webinars as a set time that you have to sign up, that it'll be more on demand. Um, we're piloting that now, getting all the kinks worked out. But hopefully rather than saying you have to take it, we're offering it November 10th at 10 o'clock. You can sign up at any point. So hopefully that'll make it a little easier for people to uh, get their ethics hour if they need it. And then we also can do webinars for our students on the importance of becoming licensed and our EITs and SITs walking them through the application process. We also engage through our newsletter. It typically goes out quarterly. Uh, if you're a licensee, you should be getting our newsletter. We send it to every email address we have on file. Uh, if you're not getting it, that's something you're interested in, check your online profile to see what email address we have on record for you. Again, if we have an email address on record for you, we will send our newsletter to that email address. We also have a library of all of them on our website. Again, it's just our way for us to communicate what's going on at the board. Any rule changes, enforcement actions, there's usually some article on a compliance topic, just a way to engage with our licensees. Um, this is the past couple of years, kind of our outreach program, both webinars and face-to-face -face events. We can we talk to 25, 26,000 people per year. So it is an important thing to us at the board. Um, again, if you're interested in having us come talk to your group or your company, uh, you can request that through our website. So everything I had prepared, um, can answer any questions if anybody has any. I don't know how we are timing wise. It looks like it's one o'clock, but if anyone has any questions, feel free. Yeah. Um, what does the board do to support or help with the process of procurement? Question. I don't know if everyone heard the question, but it's what the board does to help or make sure there's compliance with PSPA. Uh, Professional Services Procurement Act, is everyone familiar with it or don't need background on PSPA? Or does everyone know what we're talking about? Cool. Um, it's a tricky one, to be honest. Um, it's not really our rule. Uh, it's the comptroller's rule. So we can't enforce it against cities that like put out an advertisement and aren't complying with it. We can let them know about it and ask that they comply with it. And we can open records, request it, and then people that actually submit bids, if they provide pricing when they're not supposed to, we could take action against an individual, an individual engineer that submitted a bid when they shouldn't have. Um, so that's kind of our enforcement mechanism is against our licensees not complying with it, but we don't have any teeth against the city itself, unfortunately. Yeah. People become... <clears throat> LS, LS is now, or is that a former tradition that was dissolved when the boards emerged? So the uh, question was LSLS. Uh, there's two surveyor licenses, a registered professional land surveyor and a licensed state land surveyor. Uh, the LSLS is still out there. It's a specialized um, type of surveying, mostly dealing with state-owned land. Uh, there's only 60 of them in the state. It's still something out there that people can become, you have to be an RPLS first, and then there's a separate exam to take to be an LSLS. Um, again, it's fairly specialized, so most people don't pursue it, but it's still an active license that you can, people can still apply for. Thanks. 
Michael, before you go, sure. just wanted to give you an oh, AFE charger. I think you already awesome. have one, but thank, thank you. you for joining us. All right, y'all. Um, can we get today's attendance? We have 36 people in person, 20 people virtually, and 56 total. All right, 56 total. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Our last meeting of the year is on December 19th, and we'll have ABIA out to talk to us about the airport before um, everybody hits their December Christmas traffic out there. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. Have a good